We've traveled to Sherman Oaks, California for a, uh, a visit with um, two old adventurers. Uh, I don't mean that they're so old, but they are uh, old adventurers, I guess. And uh, they are Jim Bowles and Russell Thorson, who uh, each has a very interesting career in uh, show business and in radio and who worked together in a very adventuresome radio show not too many years ago called uh, I Love a Mystery. Jim Bowles, you played Doc Long on that series, didn't you? Yes, I did. And when uh, Carlton E. Morris tapped you for that back in, it was the late 40s, wasn't it? Yes, it was the late 40s. Were you um, uh, very much involved in radio at that time? Yes, I was quite involved in radio. I was quite involved in radio, and I was doing... I was getting acquainted with television. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What were you doing at the time of the the beginning of this? Were you working with Carlton E. Morris on the uh, uh, One Man's Family radio show at that time? No, the, Carl, uh, the One Man's Family radio show was never done from New York. It was mm -hmm. always done out here. He went back there and put on I Love a Mystery and... On the radio, and then uh, and then put on One Man's Family television from New York. Mm -hmm. And you were in both of those shows, then. Yes, Russ and I both were. Right, uh, Russ, you were um, uh, Jack Packard yeah. in the I Love a Mystery series, and on the television version of One Man's Family, I played Paul Barber, the you eldest son. Paul, yeah. and you were also Paul on the radio version yes, of that, yes. but not simultaneously. No. Well, uh, in a way, yes, because uh, after, what were they, we were about three and a half or four years, weren't we, Jim, in New York with it? I think we were four years. Four years there. We came back to um, Hollywood, and I went into the radio version of One Man's Family. And we'd been back here about six months, and Carlton called me and said, we're going to do One Man's Family as a television show, a daytime, mm -hmm. a regular soap opera thing. We did that, I think, and I played Paul on that. I think we did that for about 75 weeks, and it was a killing job because we had to be rehearsal. I think it was at 5 o'clock in the morning mm. for New York broadcast on the air here at yeah. 9.30, yeah. I think it was. The but One Man's uh, Family was a, um, a daytime yeah. television series? Yeah, on NBC. Not, uh, not evening? No, oh. no. That was after it moved out from New York. Mm -hmm. Oh, after it moved here. When it moved here, it became a, a daytime show. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So did uh, One Man's Family became a daytime soap opera. Oh, I, I'm speaking yeah. of One Man's Family. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I mean both television and radio. Uh -huh. But wasn't, um, maybe I missed something here as we were going rolling by, wasn't One Man's Family originally a more or less a prime time TV show? Yes, it was in New York. Yeah. In New York, but ori originally <coughs> it was it was a prime time radio show right. out here for yes. years. Right, and it was a half hour yeah. radio yes. show yes. for many years, and then it went in the late '40s and early '50s. It was stripped across the schedule five days a week. Right. I think it was. Yeah. It. Russell Thorson, where did your uh, show business career begin? Well. <laughs> I started out, of course, like so many kids do in high school and in college, and I took a year off in college to go with a stock company down in Texas, Jim's home estate. That lasted for about a year. And I came back and finished college, University of Montana. <coughs> and I went back to University of Iowa for a master's degree. And uh, it was the height of the depression. I couldn't get a job anywhere. And I came back to Montana, and a friend of mine called me from Ogden, Utah and said, I think there's a spot here on the radio station for you. I've done some radio work before. So I went down to Ogden, got a job there, and then started working in the little theater and saved up a little money. And in 37, I said, that's had it. I'm going to try New York. So I did, and I was very lucky to run into an old college friend of mine from Iowa. Maybe you knew him, Jim. I don't think we ever talked about him. Don McLaughlin. Very well. He's an old well, friend of mine. Don and I were great friends in college at the University of Iowa. Worked a lot together. <laughs> Don had a chance to come out to San Francisco to do a, play, a show for General Foods. And he was doing a, a transcribed half-hour deal with uh, Jay Jostin was the star on the oh, thing. Oh, yes. Knew him well. And uh, so Don said, let me try to put you into this thing, my place, which he did. 
And that kept on for a while, and uh, I picked up a few jobs, and then came the Tom Mix thing, and I went to Chicago. Because the Tom Mix show originated from Chicago. Oh, yeah. And you yeah. had to be there, of course, to oh, do it. Now, how did you get the job as Tom Mix? You were well, Tom you, Mix. You won't, uh, you won't believe this. My wife wanted to get into radio, and there was a local station there that had a soap opera thing called Daughter-in-Law, directed by, do you remember, Tony Leader? Very well. And Tony was directing it. Didn't get any money out of it. Well, my wife wanted me to work with her because she wanted to learn the business. So I did, and uh, we, I wasn't working this one particular day, but I'd talked a bit with Tony Leader and wanted to know where I was from and so forth. I told him I was from Montana. So my wife was working on the show one day, and uh, when he got through, she said, or he said, uh, where's Russ? And she said, well, I'm supposed to meet him for lunch up at the Carnegie Hall Tavern. He said, well, he's from Montana. He said, there's a guy by the name of Clarence Menzer is coming into New York to audition for a new character, a new person for Tom Mix. And he said, I know this Marge, somebody over at uh, CBS was a casting, Marge Morrow. Marge Morrow, yeah. yeah. casting director. He said, I'll call her. You get hold of Russ and send him up there. So NBC, they're auditioning. Three o'clock this afternoon. So uh, I went up, walked in one of the big audience studios. It's jammed, 200 people in there. They finally got through about seven o'clock that night. We each had a few little speeches to read. And he said, I want to see eight of you tomorrow. I was one of the eight. So uh, we went to the eight of us the next day and auditioned. And then he said, uh, I want four of you back here tomorrow to make recordings. So I came back with the three other guys. Mr. Menzer said goodbye, and you'll hear from us. That was the last I heard of it for about three weeks. And I was working on a show called, called Our True Story uh -huh. up at NBC. And we had to do two shows, two broadcasts. I was between shows, and I was sitting out in the lobby talking with some of the other guys out there, and the page boy called me over to the desk. And I had told my wife I was going to home, bring home a bottle of uh, a pint of gin so we could have a drink after the show. And I said, hello, and she said, Russ, make that a quart of scotch. I said, what do you mean? She said, you're going to Chicago to do time oh. <laughs> That's the first I knew of it. So I was off to Chicago. And I always thought that Tom Mix was a teetotaler. I didn't think that Ralston uh, Purina was the only thing well, he ever ate, you know. When the Ralston people, and they were wonderful people, came up to Chicago, they always threw a, a nice dinner party for the members of the cast, mm -hmm. and uh, there was plenty of uh, scotch and stuff floating around <laughs> to take care of people. How long did you, did you do Tom Mix? Until it was canceled. I think it was in 40, 42, I believe. I'm not yeah. certain about the It dates. was canceled? Yeah. And the war came along, you know. And uh, well, so was that the reason for it being yeah. canceled? The war? Yeah. I mean, why? What was? Practically everything in Chicago went. Oh, all I see. the soap operas. Everything went. left the Chicago. Whole thing uh -huh. left, and about did half Tom, the people. Did Tom Mix go to another? Uh, Later, it went to a mutual network. Uh, but mm -hmm. uh, did it yeah. go to Detroit or somewhere? No, it stayed right in Chicago. And Curly Bradley, who was one of the ranch boys, who sang mm -hmm. on the thing and also played a part on the thing, and Curly came out here too. And then suddenly he disappeared, and I found out he was doing Tom Mix when it came back on the air. So uh, you wonder why they wouldn't have called you back? Oh, I wouldn't have gone back. I was too well situated oh, out here at the time. No. Oh, because when it, re it it started again, it started back in Chicago. Yeah. Oh, at, yeah. That was at probably a WGN. It was WGN, and, and yeah. Mutual yeah. then at that, that point. That was yeah. Mutual, yeah. yeah. So you did those shows live five days a week then, right? Yeah. Were there repeats in there? Yeah. We had to do a repeat. We didn't mm -hmm. have the taping facilities they have now. So uh, we did mix. At, uh, it was 445 and 545. I did Kitty Keen from 1230 and then one at 130. And Midstream was on at 830 in the morning and 930 in the morning. So I had six shows a day there, five days a week. Well, you were kept pretty busy then. And then I had a Saturday night show called, uh, I think it was called Public Hero Number no. 1. John Hodiak, who later made quite a name for himself mm -hmm. in pictures, was a star of that thing. Well, you were one of the busiest guys in oh, uh, Chicago at that time. Mm -hmm. I don't know, there's an outfit called uh, Wright Sonovox. I don't know if you ever heard of it. No. They did the no. B.O. things. They had a sort of microphone oh, yeah? attached to the throat, <laughs> you know, and you could articulate the sounds. My wife was a production manager for that outfit, and she was also Meta Gibbon, the uh, Procter & Gamble home, home economist. So she was dashing from one Procter & Gamble show to another <laughs> doing commercials that time. So we rarely got to see each other. She was in the, in the soaps, and you were in the cereals. Yeah. yeah. 
Jim Bowles, where did it all begin for you, radio-wise, or show business-wise? Well, I was living out here in California. I did a play in junior high school and got the bug. And then I, then I did plays in high school, and then I started... Uh, before I went to college, I did a little radio, and then I went to college, and I worked some at the Pasadena Playhouse. And, and before I was out of college, I was doing radio. And uh, for not very much money. Mm-hmm. And then I worked a year in in radio out here after I finished college. And uh, I went to UCLA in Los Angeles City College. And after a year of doing stage plays and radio, I decided to uh, to go to New York. Mm-hmm. And so I went and and went through the struggle as as all the young <laughs> actors. And I did. I remember I did a play with Ingrid Bergman. I did Anna Christie by Eugene O'Neill and other plays in and around New York. And got a start in radio doing the various soaps, The March of Time. And that was an interesting show because you'd do it and you would... Well, one week you would you would meet Madame Jean Gaishek, the next week Wendell Wilkie, and the next week these other people, and you'd play all these famous characters. Well, how on would radio. how did a, um, a stage actor in New York um, get a job on radio? Was there just is it that easy to walk into a radio station and try to pull something together like that, or were there no, auditions? No, well, I I, I wasn't. Well, I was a stage and radio actor from from the beginning. Mm-hmm. And uh, excuse me, Jim, but I, I think you probably will agree with me. This in those days it was run entirely by the advertising agencies. Mm-hmm. You went to the agencies for jobs. You, you went to the advertising yeah. agencies. Yeah. A few yeah. of the things you'd get by going to oh, CBS, yeah, but but to CBS the, or, or NBC. Yeah, those were the house-run shows. Well, yeah, mostly the, the agencies the produced agencies the programs produced for, the, for the hired for the, the directors, clients, hired the actors uh-huh. for the yes, did everything yes. for the clients. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I and I would do movies from time to time, such as you did in New York. Yes, I remember you did uh, Man with My Face, wasn't that it? Yes. Uh, yes. We have a can telephone you, here, so we'll uh, take a break for just a second. We're chatting with Jim Bowles and Russell Thorson, two gentlemen whose contributions to the so-called golden age of radio were many, and uh, we were talking with Jim Bowles about his career. Uh, What was the first big radio job of yours, Jim? I suppose it was a a Santa Fe show where I played Walter Houston's grandson. I was quite young at the time, and it was... uh, it was quite a pleasure, and I later met him again in New York. And uh, and and I used to do calling all cars. I'm thinking back to to the beginning mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and calling all cars and and other shows out here. And then after after working in in radio a year out here, I I decided to go to New York. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I did all the. Don shows. You were in everything, really, weren't you? Well, I, I was in. I was in. I wish I had the list here. <laughs> you I, were in a program called Land of the Lost. Did that yes, come from here or there? That came from there. That mm-hmm. was a cute show. My wife and I both did that show. Mm-hmm. It was a kind of a kids program uh, with a un- set underwater, wasn't it? Yes, it was set underwater. I think they're doing some kind of a thing now uh, out here on film. I, I guess it's cartoon. Mm-hmm. But that was a fun show, and and we both did it. Oh, it was one of those Saturday morning things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It was quite fun, and it took a lot of imagination and a lot of voice versatility. Did you do many varied voices in your? Uh, yes, career? I did. Uh-huh. I did in my earlier years. I did, and I did many dialects. I am a Southerner and come from Texas, and I. I did all of those. I did New England's for years. I guess uh, 
I was on the Fred Allen show for a year. We were with Parker Findlay, and a lot of it rubbed off, you know. <laughs> <laughs> the New England. Uh, <laughs> yes, and, and, and I, I enjoy doing New England. And then I used to do lots of British and Germans. You were involved in a, uh, like uh, Russell Thorson, who was Tom Mix, and uh, very much involved with the uh, the great after-school shows there, the adventure yes. shows. You were, in, you were on Tennessee Jed for a time. Oh, yes. I, I did the comedy deputy on that for years. <laughs> that, was, that was a fun show. program opened with a shot of a rifle and somebody yelling, Got him, Tennessee, dead yeah, and, center. And then, then a yodel, I think, uh, uh, one at the beginning of it, too, yeah. <laughs> Russ, you didn't uh, have to sing the uh, Ralston jingle on that, uh, did oh you? Oh, my God. I think oh. Curly Bradley did Curly later and on. Shorty Carson and uh, Jack Ross uh -huh. did it. Uh, they were quite a successful group. Now, when your careers met, uh, was it for the first time with the um, I Love a Mystery series? Yeah. Yes, that was the first time. Now, actually, that was the second time around for I Love a Mystery, wasn't it? That's right. That's yeah. right, yeah. Carlton just uh, updated the scripts. As a matter of fact, my wife and I did quite a bit of writing on them to update them. It mm -hmm. anything to do with an airplane. You know, in the old days, 150 miles an hour, you had to change a lot of the dialogue to bring the incidents yeah. into the... My wife did a lot of writing. She did some of the writing for uh, One Man's Family also. Mm -hmm. Carlton mm -hmm. started... To Passing that out with Jim Lee, who did quite a bit of writing too. You remember? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Jack, Doc, and Reggie of the A1 Detective Agency okay. solving the mystery of the thing that cries in the night. Oh, and I remember that one. Yeah. Mercedes McCambridge was on most yeah. of those shows too, wasn't she? Crying she was, or she, screaming or something? She was on for a long time, and mm -hmm. then then she won an Academy Award and came to Hollywood, and mm -hmm. my wife Athena Lord sort of took over what mm -hmm. she had done before. And Tony Randall played uh, Reggie. Yeah. Yes. And uh, so I'm trying to remember the, how those shows played. We had, uh, of course, it was Jack who was the the brains of the outfit. He really knew what to do and how to do it. And it was uh, uh, it was Doc, and that was you, uh, Jim, uh, who would ask for the explanation of how this happened. And when Jack would tell you, then you'd say. Uh, Something like "Honest to my grandma" or uh, <laughs> one of those great Carl E. Morris lines that said, uh, oh. "And Tony Randall as Reggie would say, I say," and that was mostly what he did. <laughs> well, I, th I think uh, I think Reggie was the muscle man of the. Uh -huh. He was, you know, yeah. when when someone was too big for for Jack or Doc, they, they'd have Reggie take care of him. Was that was that? Uh, would you consider your time in that particular series? Was it? Was it just a job, or did you oh, think you were doing something special with it? Or it was time? fun time. Uh -huh. It was fun time. We we had great fun on that show. Uh, well, one man's family, of course, any television, I think you'll agree, Jim, is work. Mm -hmm. It's hard work. And live television in those days was real hard. They didn't have cue cards or idiot sheets or anything for you. You knew your lines, or you just forgot them, that's all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, oh, you were in big trouble. Yeah, you were in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you worked, uh, Russ, with the One Man's Family on on radio, mm -hmm. and you were the the eldest son of the Barber family then. Right. And uh, for how many years did you do that? Well, let's see. We did on television. I was not doing uh, Jack Barber or Paul Barber uh, when we went to New York. Mm -hmm. I had been doing a character called uh, Lusk. He was a... A German who had helped Claudia get out of a concentration camp in mm -hmm. Germany, and uh, it's kind of a strange story. Carlton is, uh, of course, a very dear friend. He, I had gone back to uh, Wisconsin to see my mother, who had been quite ill, and uh, I came back on the train. My wife met me at the station, and uh, she said, uh, "Carlton Morris wants to call. It, wants you to call him immediately." And I said, "Fine, I'll call." It was a Saturday morning. I knew Carlton was up about 5.30 in the morning to write every day, so it was about 9 o'clock I called him. He said, did you have a nice trip? And I said, yes. He said, well, don't unpack your bag. I said, what do you mean, don't unpack my bag? He said, well, you're going back to New York next Thursday. <laughs> I said, what? He said, well, the Mike Profetto doesn't want to go. So he said, you're going to do Paul. That's the first I knew I was going to play Paul on, 
on uh, one man's family. So we let her, rented the house out and boarded the train and went. <laughs> and how long did that last then? How well, long were you doing we were supposed that? to go for 13 weeks. Mm -hmm. And uh, we all went from here, from Hollywood. So we went back and we rehearsed for about a week, and then we put one of the episodes, uh, videotaped it. And they showed it to the NBC executives. And they said, uh uh, no, no way. You've got to start from the beginning. Because we picked it up right where the radio show was working at the yeah, time. Yeah. And uh, so Carlton called me and said, the whole thing is off except for you. He said, I'm sending everybody else back to Hollywood. But he said, they want you to stay to continue doing Paul. So then we started holding auditions. And uh, Bert Lytell, Marjorie Gateson, Lillian Schaff, and Jim, and uh, Tony Randall. And then we started right from the beginning, where Carlton had started the original One Man's Family mm -hmm. on radio in uh, San Francisco. And that's the way it worked. So the, the TV series just started all over right and the went right through. Yeah. And it lasted for a good long time on television, didn't well, it? Well, four years, I think. Mm -hmm. Four year. years of the half hour show. Yeah, and mm -hmm. then a year and a half out here. And the uh, I Love a Mystery thing was a complete shocker to me because we used to rehearse in the early days there at NBC on Un Man's Family in the morning. And Carlton and I would usually go down to a restaurant called the Down Under, mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. basement of the building and have lunch, and we were having lunch there one day, and he was paid to telephone. And he came back uh, about five minutes later and said, uh, you want another job? And I said, what kind of a job is this? He said, how do you like to do Jack Packard on I Love a Mystery? He had made the set the deal over the telephone right then at lunchtime. <laughs> so then we started hunting for casting for uh, I Love a Mystery. Well, Jim, how did you get that uh, role then? Do you recall? Yes, I, uh, <coughs> I think... Uh, I think Jimmy McCallion recommended me, and I went over for a quick reading and went home, and nothing happened, and then I uh, I said, I should be doing that role, because for years people had told me I sounded like Barton Yarborough. I had never met him. And so I called up and said, I want to read again. And Carlton said, all right, and so I went in again, and he said, do it. Oh. And so uh -huh. that's how I got Doc. Well, that's a good way to get it. We had, a lot of, we had a great cast on that mm -hmm. show, didn't we? Oh, you we had a marvelous cast. Louis Van Ruten and Bob Dryden did most of the character mm -hmm. stuff. And they could do voices, all kinds of voices, couldn't they? They were yes, terrific. They were, they were very great versatile. Yeah. Was that, was that <coughs> mutual? Was yeah. that a mutual series? And you did that out of Mutual's uh, New York studios then? Yes, yes, out of Mutual's And was New that York. recorded at the time? Was that done on... on uh, Disc, I suppose, maybe even taped by that point, huh? No, I don't think it was taped then. I think it was probably disc. It was probably disc. Mm -hmm. But were we, uh, it, it was done live, though. Yeah, but they, they would. But, but they they would make. They recorded a, it for distribution yeah. to other stations. Yeah, because Mutual had a different kind of a, a setup than yeah. the the other networks. I yeah. know. Yeah. Well, then where did um, from that particular point, uh, Jim? Where did you go from? Well, and after then. I was on One Man's Family mm -hmm. a while, uh, Carlton said, uh, I'm not talking, after I was on I Love a Mystery for a while, Carlton said, uh, would you like to be on One Man's Family? And I said, sure. So he wrote me a character in that lasted a while. It was a kind of a heavy. And then, then he wrote me something in the vein of Doc Long. He, uh, of a of a marine sergeant who was courting Eva Marie Saint with a Texas accent and this and he named the character after Martin Yarborough who was who had played Doc originally and and I was Marine Sergeant Joe Yarborough <laughs> and I was that for a long time. Tony Randall was a sailor and I was Marine and we were both courting Eva Marie Saint who was already married to somebody else and <laughs> I think Les Tremaine even came in on that once in a yes, while yes. Uh, on the TV uh, I think series. He did. Yeah. Yes. He was yeah. not a regular on the, on the no, show. No, he was not a regular, but he, but he came in on occasion, I think. Well, both of your careers were tied to Carlton E. Morse. Uh, 
What kind of a man was he to work for? Was he a hard taskmaster, or was he, uh, he was easygoing, or what? The nicest person. I'll give you an example. When we went back to New York, <coughs> and my wife will swear to this, we were sitting in the, our bedroom on the train when took the chief back. And she suddenly turned to me and said, what kind of a salary are you getting for this job? And I didn't know. We had never talked huh. money. I didn't know till the first paycheck came in <laughs> what Carlton was paying for me. And I was amazed that I got as much money as no. I did, frankly. But then you were satisfied. Oh, yeah. I, but Carlton and I have become very, very close friends during the years. I've never had a contract with him. Well, I did on I Love a Mystery. I've never had a contract with him. I've never talked money. He's, he's just been a wonderful man to work with. He had some very interesting <coughs> ideas of working with actors. Some directors... They'll go at you and at you and at you to get a particular reading that they want on the line. Mm -hmm. Carlton would do it three times and then quit. It was his theory, it his belief, firm belief. If you couldn't do it right to, after the third time he directed you, with it, you were never going to get it. So he just let it go. He was a very warm oh, guy. Oh, very. Mm -hmm. Very nice to work for. I never, very, very I never nice heard him book. say an unkind word about a single person on any of his shows. I mean, he had a, a, loyal a good group of people, yeah. and he used them in all of his many enterprises. He had a stock he did company. Lots of things. Oh, uh, my. Yeah. And he, he cast good people. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so, well, I guess you, you don't have to direct mm -hmm. as much if you do. I asked him once um, <coughs> how, um, how he had so many top-notch people working for him for such a long time because many people who worked for him worked for him for 15 years and longer and he said um, I paid him well you know yeah. not only paid him well, one he treated him but well too. Treat he treated treatment of course is well. important I think yeah I remember when we were uh, we were talking contract when I first did the show and uh, I was doing something on another show you know uh, a running thing, and so I, uh, and so I said to Carlton, "Well, Carlton, couldn't you pay a little more than that?" And uh, and he said, "Well, uh, if I paid it to you, I'd have to pay it to Russ and pay it to Tony." And he said, "All right." <laughs> I don't think Russ ever, no, ever, ever knew that I got him a raise. But <laughs> I'm grateful to you, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> well, see now. <laughs> Does Tony know that, I wonder? Huh? I told Tony once. <laughs> <laughs> well, after the, uh, the experience in those uh, areas, One Man's Family and I Love a Mystery, uh, you folks, uh, the two of you, Jim Bowles and Russell Thorson, kind of went your separate ways, didn't you? Yeah, Ru Ru Russ came back to California and I stayed in New mm -hmm. York mm -hmm. until, I guess, 13 years ago I came out mm -hmm. here. Yeah. And what were you occupied with uh, Jim and all that time? Uh, well, radio was dying off, and so I was uh, doing mostly television and stage plays and, and, and movies from time to mm -hmm. time. You worked with uh, Phil Silvers on the, the Bilko series, didn't yes, you? Yes, uh -huh. yes, I, I did that. I didn't do it a lot, I did it on occasion. Mm -hmm. Well, you were uh, rather busy in television uh, as a character actor. As uh, I mean, in you'd have all kinds of um, makeup uh, so that you would be disguised from one show yes, to another. Yes, I, I did uh, Abraham Lincoln a number of times. Mm -hmm. I did Robert E. Lee. I did <laughs> all kinds of characters. Did you I, ever, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Did you ever get involved in films and motion pictures? Uh, I I did well. Uh, it isn't too easy in New York because they don't do too much. I mm -hmm. I went down to Puerto Rico in 1950 and did the Man with My Face, which was an interesting character, and uh, and I did the Pusher in New York and a few others. But I did most of my pictures after I came out mm -hmm. out here. Out here, yeah. And some of those. Oh gosh. Uh, I have to look at this picture. So he, you're lo he's looking at a uh, a magnificent wall in his home here that has uh, uh, portrait after portrait, photo after photo uh, uh, 
up there with uh, some of the great characterizations. I can't go to Russ for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> we'll pause now and talk to Russell Thorson. Uh, Russ, you came out here shortly after that, yeah. at the end of this period of the uh, right after family yes. and all of that. And you were quite busy, too, in, uh, in television, weren't you? Well, yes, and pictures. Mm-hmm. It, uh, it's, it's been good. Uh, when radio's uh, faded out, I somehow managed to break into the television. and I had, didn't, I had done two pictures here before we went back, so I knew a few people. Mm-hmm. And uh, I had the pleasure of working in one picture that got an Academy Award called I Want to Live. Susan Hayward mm-hmm. got an Academy mm-hmm. Award of that. Robert Wise directing it. And then I did a series with Robert Taylor called Detectives for several mm-hmm. years. Mm-hmm. And did just a series with Thomas Mitchell called The O'Henry Stories. That's, that was in, oh, in the very early 50s I mm-hmm. did that. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's just I don't know, just been one thing after another. My agent calls me and says, do you want to do this? Why, I say yes or no, depending on what uh-huh. it is. And you made a comment before we, we started chatting here for our, our tape recorder um, about the demise of radio, the yeah. short life of it. Well, it was, a, it was a wonderful and exciting life. And to me, I thought a great... Chicago, I believe it was in 38. There was something like 41 dramatic radio shows coming out of uh, Chicago, 41 mm-hmm. a week, mm-hmm. separate shows. And I think when we left there in in 1942 to come out here, there were about five or six left. It just the bottom simply mm-hmm. fell out of it. And I missed it very much. I enjoyed radio very much. But of course, it was mostly television after the war that oh, yes. uh, really shut the lid on uh, it completely on shut radio. the lid on it but you were very much involved with radio right up to the very end uh, right up to the end yeah i guess cbs was the last of the yes i think i outs. i think i did the last uh, radio show network radio show that was done here dramatic show called johnny dollar mm-hmm. with, uh, bob bailey an ex chicagoan mm-hmm. was uh, playing johnny dollar on it and i think that was the the curtain i don't think there's ever been anything done since then that was about 12 years uh, ago. The curtain may have fallen on the radio, but the memories are still oh, there. Oh, yes, and I lots of, they uh, are. Lots of people really do remember yeah. the uh, the great radio shows. And uh, I think, of course, the most important part of it was the fact, as you say, it was the theater of the imagination because the listener could participate. He certainly could. Right. I still hear uh, I Love a Mystery once in a while. There is a, an FM station out in Pasadena that is... I suppose it's pirating would be the same name, mm-hmm. but uh, they played quite a few of the uh, I Love a Mystery series that uh, Jim and I and Tony worked on. Yeah. Did you know that, Jim? Yes, I, I know. I heard about. In fact, I those I Love a Mystery fans still call me. Oh, I get letters from guys in Chicago. <laughs> I do. I, there's a, a man back there who has a, a a firm that manufactures or distributes or leases or something heavy industrial equipment, forklifts and that uh-huh. sort of thing. And I can count on a three- or four-page letter from him every single year. Mm-hmm. He remembers incidents that I had completely forgotten. There are lots of, um, lots of fans oh, okay. uh, who recall those shows. They were great, they were great adventures. They you know. were. Now, Jim Bowles has gotten a fantastic stack of uh, memories in front of him now. Well, I, I was blank before, so I went in and picked <laughs> this magazine up that came out in April, and there's an article on me, and it lists... Pictures, pictures, pictures that I've done, and so it's ridiculous to have to go find a booklet. <laughs> to find, to this is films, uh, films in review hmm? from yes, uh, film. April of '76. Yes, uh-huh. and uh, and it, this is a lovely article. They say lovely things about me, but I'll just uh, uh, read some of the uh, the tattooed stranger in 1951. The Man with My Face, 57, Naked in the Sun, 1960. That's one I did down in Florida. And The Pusher, 62, The Most Wanted Man in the World, 64. That, that, that's, uh, that's one that I did in French. I had to speak French with Fernandel. 
Fate is the hunter. He rides tall. That's 65. And Fluffy was the one I did with Tony Randall. The greatest story ever told, for which was an interesting mm-hmm. there's a story of the Bible. John Goldfarb, Please Come Home. The Trouble with Angels. I enjoyed that with Rosalind Russell. And A Big Hand for the Little Lady. That was a lovely picture, I thought. The Ghost and Mr. Chicken, Reluctant Astronaut, mm-hmm. or I did with, with Don Knotts. Mm-hmm. Waterhole Number 3, The Karate Killers, which was an adaptation of a, of a TV thing where I played Joan Crawford's husband. The Six You Get Egg Roll with Doris Day, Shakiest Gun in the West, PJ, Angel in My Pocket, The Love God, another Don Knotts, WUSA with Paul Newman. I did it down around Puerto Rico, but they cut me out of it. When the Line Goes Through, I did it in 71. That's when I played a man 130 years old. And uh, Skin Game, I, I, under, I uh, enjoyed that very much. And my wife, Athena Lord, played a nice part in that. Mm-hmm. And Le Mans, Ace Eli and Roger of the Skies, Dr. Death, Seeker of Souls. That's one I did, and my <laughs> wife did, and my son, and my daughter were all in that The whole picture. family, the yeah. talented family. Uh-huh. Yeah. It shows how you have made a great transition uh, and how many facets of your talent have been explored over the years, uh, from the stage to radio to television to films, and uh, I know Russ Thorson uh, has a parallel career in many of those areas, too. Pretty much the same, yes. I think it's a thing that an awful lot of radio actors and stage actors had to make the transition into films and television. No other way if you're going to stay in the business. You had to. I think I think there are probably more radio actors who have been able to adapt to, well, let's say to television and the movies than there ever were motion picture actors able to adapt to radio. Well, I think it's because as a radio actor, you had to be fairly versatile. Mm-hmm. And you had to be quick. You had to be quick. You had to... Uh, you came in and picked up the script, and uh, you read it through for a timing, and then boom, you had a dress rehearsal, and then boom, you did the show. Mm-hmm. And there was no fooling around. You just you had your job to do, and you do, did it. In, uh, because hurry, you know. s- sometimes in motion pictures, uh, one day you have a few lines that you do, and you work on them, and then they rehearse them, and you do them. And then when it's wrong, you do it over, you do it over. But in radio, you have these pages to do. Mm-hmm. And maybe you have one little rehearsal, and bingo, you've got to be on. So you have to be quick and alert. Well, you two fellas uh, provided those of us who uh, listen to radio in the good days of uh, radio imagination with some of the best that there was. And uh, I'm happy to be here with you two today to say thank you very much for for giving us that pleasure. You're very welcome. I've enjoyed it, haven't you, Jim? I've enjoyed it very much. Thanks very much, Russell Thorson and Jim Bowles.